My name is Monk Rowe and we're filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive on the Hamilton campus. I'm very pleased to have Steve Wilson with me today and welcome to the college. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, It's great to hear you and your, your band talk about what you do and where it comes from and I'll start off with something really easy like whatever possessed you to try to make a living in the jazz world? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you know, I think it was just being inspired very young, uh, being exposed to the music by uh, my father, who was a music enthusiast and had all kinds of music around the house. And first record I remember hearing live was uh, Ahmad Jamal, live to Pershing, of course, with Poinciana and mm -hmm. you know, Miles Davis, live in Europe. But there were other things, you know, Mary McCabe, uh, James Brown. Uh, he was a big Mario Lanza fan. So. There was a whole array of music and seeing music live when I was small at the, uh, in Hampton, Virginia at the Hampton mm -hmm. Jazz Festival and seeing people like Cannonball Adderley, Eddie Harris, Les McCann, Rasan Roland Kirk, getting all of that early was what inspired me to do it. So I pretty much knew by the time I was 12 or 13, you know, mm -hmm. I, this is something I really loved and, and wanted to do it. Did your father play an instrument? No, he, um, he sang in a uh, spiritual choir, mm -hmm. um, but uh, not a trained musician. Uh, I did have other relatives who were uh, musicians, and, and, and all of my friends in the neighborhood played music. So with all of that, you know, inspired mm -hmm. me to, to uh, do it. Did your parents, um, were they supportive in your choice? Yeah, actually they were. Um, I think uh, not until I was... 18 did they really begin to take me seriously as uh, mm -hmm. you know someone who wanted to do this uh, professionally uh, I think you know as any parent you know you, you think oh, okay well they're gonna go through several phases you yeah. know but uh, no I even as a teenager I was playing in garage bands and playing in, in uh, R&B bands and disco bands and going out making money on the weekends and that kind of thing mm -hmm. playing at school dances and Elks Lodges the whole thing yeah. you know so, uh, yeah, but so by the time I was 18, you know, I started to do it, they thought, okay, well, this is what he's what is really going to do. Yeah, it always helps when you're bringing home some, a few dollars, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. And sometimes, you know, if you're lucky, a musician can make in one night what your friends might be taking a few days at the garage. That's, that's right. That's right, and especially as a teenager, and I didn't have to ask my parents for money all the time, you mm -hmm. know, so it worked out. Was there a thought of that... Uh, Maybe you should get a teaching degree in music, just in case. Yeah, not so much from them. Uh, I mean, I was advised by a few people to think about that, and uh, even some of the instructors I had in college. You know, I never really thought about that, to tell you the truth. And mm -hmm. quite honestly, you know, I, I, ironically, I now find if I'm ever giving advice to students, that's one of the things that I yeah. suggest. You know, and if I had to do it all over again, that's probably the thing that I would mm -hmm. do. I would probably do like a, either a teaching or composition degree but uh, because you know as, if you're going to go to college in, in music as a music major you're going to perform anyway you know uh, so certainly I think you know uh, teaching uh, t having a teaching degree is yeah it's, it's great and you got a degree in performance yeah right yeah you never know what you're gonna want to do like when you're 50 and Exactly. I suppose. Exactly. And I tell students all the time now that, look, you know, even if you go into your career as a performer, and it's wonderful, it's great, <clears throat> but at some point when you get to be, you know, 40-something, 50-something, the road is not going to be as romantic anymore. Mm -hmm. It wears off. So uh, you're going to start to think about things like, yeah, I'd like to be home or I'd like mm -hmm. to have a family or something like yeah. that. So, you know, have some options, you know. What... Uh brought you to the saxophone. Was it first your first instrument? Yeah, um, formally anyway. I really wanted to be a drummer oh. uh, uh, before the age of 12. But I think what changed me to uh, saxophone was, was hearing the record uh, Swiss Movement, um, Les McCann and Eddie Harris, yeah. because I was a big hit around 1969, 1970. And that was one of the records my father had. And, and uh, I gravitated to that. And then with allowance money, I started going out and buying a couple of Eddie Harris records, and and of course, uh, Cannonball Adderley's Country Preacher was a big hit at the time. So all of those things, I said, oh, this is this is I like the way this sounds, you know, I like the way this feels, you know. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna talk about those guys in a while. Okay. Actually. Okay. <laughs> Some of my favorites too. Um, 
when you're in college, this was in, still in Virginia, right? Uh, Richmond. Richmond, Richmond okay. Was there this thought in your mind that eventually I'm going to go to New York City? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I knew that I would eventually have to go to New York um, to pursue the music. I mean, once, once my love for the music really developed while I was in college, because we had people coming through all the time. We had uh, my first, well, my first week of school, you know, uh, Elvin Jones came through and band he had with Andrew White and Ari Brown. Um, Sonny Rollins came through a couple of years later and uh, people like Frank Foster, uh, Jackie Byer, the Heath brothers, they all came in for a week residency. Benny Carter also came mm. in. Wow. And all directions at that time pointed to New York. Now I do want to say that at that time Richmond was a great place to be. It was, the music scene was really happening. We had three big bands at school. Um, the uh, director of the program at the time, Doug Richards, dealt with Duke Ellington, particularly early Duke Ellington, as a cornerstone of uh, the program. So that it wasn't just, you know, everything post-1950 or post-1960. We dealt with, you know, the early, mm -hmm. uh, with early jazz as much as we did, you know, Thad Jones and Mary Lou Williams and other things. I see. Uh, we covered the whole history. Um, but yeah, I, I knew pretty much around 1985, I would have to go to New York, you know, at least to give it a try and to, to go and play with the musicians that I had, you know, had been admiring and mm. listening to and sort of seek them out, you know. Um, so yeah. Did you arrive with any contacts in place? Yeah, uh, fortunately, um, I had just joined a band called Out of the Blue which was a Young Lions group put together by Blue Note Records at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I replaced Kenny Garrett, who had gone on to join uh, Art Blakey and subsequently Miles. Um, so I was in that band when I got to New York, but the band didn't have any work. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I had to start all over again. I had, uh, while I was living in Virginia, I was in a fusion group that was working all of the time and, and I was working other jazz gigs. Uh, so I gave all of that up to move to New York. But it was worth it uh, because I went out and sat in with different people. I met a lot of different people, uh, sitting in with people like John Faddis or uh, David Murray. Um, Hamiet Blewett had a band at the time called the Telepathic Orchestra with, uh, with younger and older musicians in the band. So, so I had contacts in a lot of different areas uh, moving there. What kind of places did those jam sessions happen in back then? Mm. Were they small clubs and that kind of thing? Uh, let's see, well, 19, uh, late 1980s, we're talking uh, like the Blue Note had a late, uh, late night jam session, mm -hmm. like uh, after the last show on, during the week, so usually starting at 1 o'clock. Uh, and, and people like Justin Robinson and, uh, and the Harper Brothers were heading those jam sessions. Then there was a jam session of town at this place called uh, Augie's, which is now called Smoke. Mm -hmm. um, but Augie's was a place... Uh, uh, where a lot of guys, you know, honed their, their craft guys like Larry Goldings and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Freddie Bryant, young guitarist that I've been working with for quite a while, um, Billy Drummond. Um, a lot of the young musicians would just go up and play all the time. Uh, the Village, um, uh, not the Village Vanguard, but the other club, Village the Gate. Close, Village Gate, yeah. had, uh, had some stuff going. Then they had another club uptown. Um, near Columbia University uh, that also had some sessions. And of course, uh, my good friend and partner, Bruce uh, Barth, um, that uh, we met around that time and started jamming together at his house, you know, and his wife was kind enough to, you know, let us all come over, you know, a couple of times a week and play. And, uh, and we've been working together now for like 14 years as a result of that. So. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it happened in a variety of clubs. That tradition of kind of uh, getting into jam sessions and hopefully proving yourself has been around for a long time. But in the late 80s, was the repertoire that you're expected to know, was it still the standards? Or oh yeah, oh yeah. And uh, that was probably one of the first things that hit me when I moved to New York was uh, having to learn those standards or relearn them. Uh, I had been learning some of these tunes, you know, like some of the Monk tunes and some of the tunes in American Songbook, 
before I moved there. But man, you know, these musicians, these young musicians knew all of these tunes inside and out. So it really forced me to, you know, build my repertoire and, and uh, it was very healthy to do that. Mm -hmm. It forced me to do it, you know. Did anybody ever call things like in non-standard keys? Yeah, occasionally, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, occasionally. It didn't happen too much, no. but when I started working with vocalists, oh, right. you know, and then of course they called, yeah, you know, all the things you are, you know, in, uh, you know, an F, you know, instead of A flat, you like, oh, yeah, what's the first chord, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, so, uh, yeah. Was there any, um, uh, I'm not sure what word to use, competitiveness or even unpleasant atmosphere in some of those sessions, like people trying to make you look foolish? You know, I didn't experience that. Uh -huh. um, I had heard, uh, you know, certain sessions of certain people that could be that way, but uh, I didn't experience that particularly. One thing that it was very healthy that you were around great players who, who either had more ability or more knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so I saw it as very healthy because it, it, it was a, a reference of what one needed to go home and, and work on, you know. So, yeah, I, I certainly got my behind kicked many times in, in jam sessions and, and probably still would, still do. There's mm -hmm. a lot I don't know. Um, but that's a healthy part of music. That's what keeps us humble. That's what keeps us growing. You know, we never know it all. Uh, Off the top of your head, what are, oh, let's say, five tunes that you better know inside and out? If you're going to get up on a jam session. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's a standard rhythm changes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of course, in B flat, but be ready to do them in any key. Mm -hmm. um, Cherokee, uh, the blues, that, that never changes. Right. And, of course, you could always throw in a couple of American songbook standards, you know, Green Dolphin Street, uh, All the Things You Are. Yeah. Um, but basically those three, those first three, uh, and of course, well, you could throw giant steps in there because eventually somebody's going to throw that at you. Really? Yeah, what, you know. Uh, one of the tunes, actually, one of the tunes that I had never really learned when I first moved to New York and got called to me a couple of times was, um, uh, what's the title of it? I can't think of the title of it now, unfortunately. Um, I can't. I guess I don't know it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I can't. Rec I'm getting bad with titles. Mm. Uh, but I, I went home and learned that off of a Dexter Gordon record oh. because someone called it on me at a jam session one night, uh, and I thought, okay. And I remember Harold Mayburn telling me some years later, you know, when he was in Chicago, cutting his teeth, and, and it happened to him all the time. And he says, yeah, well, you know, first time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, yeah, when that, whenever that happens, go home, learn that tune immediately. And yeah. Oh, it's, it's You and No One. That's the name of the tune. Okay. It's You and No One. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, I learned from that experience. It's like you can never know all of them, it it's seems impossible. like. It's As a matter of fact, I, take, um, I occasionally play with a, a great guitarist named Peter Leach. Mm -hmm. He has a regular Sunday night gig in New York at a place called Walker's, just duo. And uh, every week he has in somebody different. And I do the gig like every couple of months. And it's good for that because Peter knows a million tunes in any key. And he knows these obscure tunes that nobody knows, mm -hmm. all of these different Broadway tunes. So just last week, I played with him again. And I remember the time before that, uh, his wife Sylvia had asked me if I knew uh, one of the tunes from uh, Kismet, uh, Stranger in Paradise. Mm -hmm. So I went out and I bought the record and I learned it. Now I learned it in the original key, which was G flat. <laughs> of course, when I got on the gig, Peter's playing it in F. <laughs> okay, here we go. But that's, you know, that's part right. of the music. You know. Right. Yeah. I sometimes feel sorry for the, it, it, the bass players at it, sessions. <coughs> for, for one thing, they have to play forever, you know. Yeah. Plus, it seems to me they have, as a horn player, you can kind of, well, you don't have to know the roots all the time. You know, you can mm -hmm. negotiate with your ear somewhat, but mm -hmm. the bass player, you hope he knows the changes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, ironically, I, that's what I'm listening for is roots mm -hmm. most of the time. Um, and, 
when I'm learning tunes, I do it in two ways. I go to the piano, I learn what the root movement is, I learn the chords and I learn the melody. So that way I can correlate the melody with the root movement. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm caught in a situation where I'm not very familiar, I find those bookends, the outline helps me a lot, you yeah. know, because if I can't hear one or the other, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really lost, you know, mm -hmm. like, okay, well, <laughs> I'm just out there, you know. But it's it saved me more than a few times. Yeah. yeah. Did you have to um, work non-music jobs during this time in the, in New York? Not in New York. Uh, while I was in school, I did work mm -hmm. a non-music job. I worked in a hospital as a stock clerk mm -hmm. uh, on weekends. I, I had to work every weekend and uh, holidays, which was rough because a lot of times uh, I either wanted to, you know, holidays, you want to go home, visit your family, that kind of thing. Um, so there were times I couldn't do that, and I was always playing music on the weekends. Yeah. You know? So I went to work from 8 to 5, and then I would play a gig from maybe 8 to 12 or 9 to 1, and get up mm -hmm. on Sunday morning, go back to the hospital. So, yeah, paid a few dues. And right. before that, actually, uh, in high school, I was a shoe salesman. Mm -hmm. And um, I washed dishes for one night uh, <laughs> in uh, the chain called Bennigan's Tavern. Uh, uh -huh. And luckily, I had just auditioned for a disco band. And the day, the very day that I got hired to wash dishes, I found out later <clears throat> that evening that they had hired me. The disco band had decided mm -hmm. that they wanted me to play with them. So I quit the job the next day. Right. Yeah. Well, having those kind of those kind of jobs helps keep things in perspective, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, when we're talking about playing music or being an artist of any kind, we're talking about, you know, uh, humility and humanity. And, and we have to remember that, you know, we're communicating, when we're performing, we're communicating with people who, with 99% of your audience is non-musicians. So, we're really trying to communicate to everybody. So sometimes as artists, we tend to take these things for granted and what people do in, in their daily life. So mm -hmm. I think it really keeps, keeps us connected with that, absolutely. Yeah. Did you have a time when you felt, this is my break, a phone call, or an opportunity to play with someone that you felt was really a, a door opener for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've had that several times mm -hmm. throughout my career. Um, when I was in college, well, even my first gig out of high school, which was the disco group that traveled along the East Coast, because that was my dream at the time, was to just get out and travel and play music every night. Didn't mm -hmm. matter what kind of music, I just wanted to play. So even that experience, represented that to me. Uh, and then when my first year in college, I got a call from a friend of mine who was working with Stephanie Mills, uh, who at the time was, had just come off of uh, the lead in uh, The Wiz, which of course was the Broadway version yeah. of Wizard of Oz. And she was going out as a solo R&B artist. And he says, hey man, you know, she needs some horn players. Would you like to come audition for the band? And, and I did, came, that was my first trip to New York. Went there and did it. Went on the road with her for a year, went back to school. Uh, then playing with Out of the Blue starting in 1986, getting that call. And then after moving to New York, getting a call to play with Lionel Hampton. Uh, and it just keeps going. So every opportunity that comes, I felt like, yeah, this is the door I've been, mm -hmm. you know, I've been looking to open. And it's, and it's kept going that way. It probably ne will never end. Exactly, you know? exactly, which, which is the beauty of it, you know. Now, I do have a little bit of, a bit more perspective on the music business, mm -hmm. per se, and so I'm not as excited to say when I was 18, because yeah. I'm looking at it more as a professional musician. Right. Um, but nonetheless, it, it continues to, to steer my, my hunger for the music and, yeah. and to broaden my musical relationships. What was it like working with uh, Gates? Wow. Uh, it Did was, he call you Gates by Oh way? yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, everybody was Gates. Everybody was Gates. Uh, well, it was going to school in a number of ways. Um, <laughs> learning the ways of the road. Um, learning that, you know, there were guys on, on that gig who were much older than, than 
I was at the time. And some of the things that would get me a bit irate, you know, some of the working conditions, and to see these guys to not get so mad. And they just had a better understanding of the big picture. Big picture. Yeah. Uh, of course, when you're, you know, in your 20s, you know, you want it all right now, and you want everything to happen, you want everything to be right. But, uh, but also from Gates himself, I mean, he gave 100% every night when he came onto the stage. Uh, he was an amazing performer, and he was into his 80s um, by the time I was working with him. And uh, he would take various medications, you know, uh, depending on the state of his health to keep him up or whatever. Uh, but no matter what condition he was in, he always came out to perform. He never shortchanged the audience, never. So I learned, prob that was the most valuable thing I learned from, from watching him. Mm. Uh, and he was a great musician. Uh, and a lot of people don't know, I mean, people who see him as a, just a performer, he was really a great musician. You know, he knew a lot about music. He knew a lot of music. Um, uh, and I've listened to some of the earlier records now uh, from the 30s and 40s that he's done. And he was a great contributor to this music. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was, he knew his theory, too, I think, from some of the things I've read. Yeah, you know, like yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of the musicians of my generation tend to dismiss him because he didn't play in a so-called modern uh, vernacular, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like, you know, things that post-bebop vernacular. But it's not about that. I mean, you, you listen to those records, and there's, believe me, there's more than enough information that we could all yeah. learn from that he was disseminating. So, yeah. absolutely. Well, what is post-bebop vernacular for you? Uh, particularly... Uh, like, well, like yesterday we were talking about Coltrane. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking more of the hard bop from hard, from mid-50s on, like, you know, Sonny Rollins, uh, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, uh, uh, John Coltrane, Joe Henderson, Woody Shaw, Freddie Hubbard, J.J. Um, Johnson. I'm thinking more in terms of that, you know, the post, from mid-50s on. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, with, even now, you know, you, you've got so many great young players out here who have learned that part of the language. Uh, what I find in my experiences as an educator uh, and as a musician is that, uh, again, a lot of people who are, say, you know, 40 and under haven't bothered to get what Kenny Washington calls pre-bop pre uh, and uh, music before Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, and I'm thinking of people like Benny Carter, um, Chu Berry, um, Fletcher Henderson, um, all of the great big bands, even all of the soloists in the Ellington bands at the time, you know, Sidney Bechet. You know, those were incredible improvisers. They, they were absolutely incredible. I mean, amazingly inventive. And of course, the language that they were dealing with, the musical language, is not as complex harmonically necessarily. Um, as say you know bebop on, but rhythmically, uh, it's very very complex mm -hmm. and melodically, it's so fluid. I mean, yeah. we were talking earlier about people like Kenny Deverne and, and Joe Wilder, Joe Wilder who I yeah. absolutely love, and I've had the good fortune of working with him on several occasions. Saw a concert of his recently at NYU, and he was just amazing and it sounded so modern it's really? so modern you know we don't think not in the sense of like well yeah it's the coming out of a woody shaw thing or a freddie hubbard thing mm -hmm. no but in his own language it's his own syntax mm -hmm. and he played some things that you know made us all raise our eyebrows like what was that where did he find that how did he pull that out of the air so we tend to dismiss some of these musicians that we don't associate with a modern mm -hmm. Coltrane era, you know, but I, I would beg to differ that, you know, that they are just as relevant, you mm -hmm. know, as, as uh, anybody in, it, in uh, the modern era. Plus what you can learn from a guy like Joe from his everyday life and his, his character. That's right. You know? He is uh, the gentleman's gentleman. Never leaves the house without a suit and tie on. Yeah. 
you know, uh, always a perfect gentleman uh, and loves a great joke and loves to play practical jokes on people. Mm. And, uh, you know, and he's been through a lot in, in his career. You know, he, he was doing it when there weren't, when we didn't have the modern, modern conveniences we have now, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and there's not one bitter bone in his body. Right. You know, um, and he continues to just represent the best of what this music is, you know. So I, I love him. I yeah. really do. He's been here, by the way, a couple times. And well, I agree, he, man. He's, yeah. he's one of the best. Yeah, he, he always, whenever he shows up, with, you know, it's like we're all going to be graced with his presence. You yeah. Know? yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's people, him and Mill Tinton and uh, a number of others who just have this you feel better when you're around them. Absolutely. What a great way to be, you know. Absolutely. It, you know, great music changes the way, you know, we, we can feel about ourselves and about the world. And, and great, mu great musicians can do that. And, and those are the kind of people. When you're just, like, being around people like Benny Carter and, and uh, Joe Wilder. And I had the chance to, uh, actually, I shared a, uh, a floor with Milt Hinton for a few months. We had a, both had our practice studios, uh, mm. where the uh, Musicians Union building is now in New York uh -huh. City. That was where a and Studios was for many years. And on the fifth floor, there was a radio network for the blind, and they had several uh, vacant spaces. And I shared a rehearsal room with the, with the guy, and Milt's room was right next door. And I got to see him a couple of times up there, and, and he was just wonderful, just absolutely wonderful, you know. Uh, so getting the chance to be around those kind of people keeps you humble, mm -hmm. um, because we tend to, in this modern era, so to speak, we tend to have this sense of entitlement. Mm. And then you see these guys who have really paved the way for us to be doing what we're doing, and it's like, okay, now, okay, I got it. You know, uh -huh. I, I really understand what it's all yeah. about. Yeah. Well, the, it seems like the business has changed pretty rapidly. Like, you probably have an agent. Mm -hmm. You have a manager. Mm -hmm. um, in years past, a guy like Mill Tinton probably would do his own booking. Mm -hmm. Is Are there advantages and or disadvantages to the way things are now? Yeah. Uh, the scene has totally changed. Uh, even in the last 20 years, it's become much more industry driven. Uh, by that I mean record companies, particularly major record companies, uh, booking agents, presenters, um, and I think presenters, I'm thinking of like festival presenters, club owners, have had a, a big influence and I think to a degree too much influence on who on which musicians get exposed. Mm -hmm. Prior to the 1980s, the music always took care of that. It was the relationships that you forged in the music. So when we talk about people like Milt Hinton, George de Vivier, you know, they were doing record sessions all the time. You know, they were, they were great professional musicians. They could play anything at any time. Um, so, you know, they could go out and play clubs, they can go out and do uh, road gigs with big bands or singers, uh, uh, go in the studio, <clears throat> you know, sight read, cut something right there on the spot. And that all but disappeared, you know, after the 1960s, 1970s. So guys, <clears throat> pardon me, like myself coming in the 1980s, we had to find other ways of doing it. Now, of course, when I came to New York, the Young Lions thing was in full, uh, full bloom. Who started uh, that, by the way? Does anybody know who? <laughs> well, at that point is often debated and discussed. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was any one person. Mm -hmm. I think it was a combination of forces. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, um, and I'm not going to say that, that Wynton Marcellus is responsible for that. He's not. Because when Wynton came on the scene, it actually was responsible for a lot of young guys like myself having uh, an interest in the music. And seeing a guy from our generation who could play and had a great love and respect for the music certainly had an effect on many of us. So I think in, in, uh, on some level he's responsible for the wave of young musicians that, that came through having a, a, a sense of 
tradition and history and the music. But on the other hand, the industry, the same industry which exposed Winton, also was deciding which young musicians were going to get a record deal or to uh, mm. or be able to record as a leader. So by the time the late 80s came around, early 90s, you had musicians who had never played with anybody and were, you know, were getting signed to major record deals. People who had never served any apprenticeship. And that's not the way this music has, mm. has evolved. It's always evolved by way of apprenticeships in the oral tradition where you go and learn from the older musicians and spend time with them and go on the road with them and get knocked around and, and learn tunes and learn how to be a total musician, learn how to play in a big band, learn how to, to play in a studio. Uh, so that, the rules changed, you know, the rules changed drastically uh, from like the 80s on. And now it's going through another transition because all of this big industry stuff has now gone by the wayside where you have uh, people like Sony Records and Verve, they've dropped a lot of artists in, in recent months. Um, uh, so I think this can turn into a positive because it puts the music back into, into the hands of the musicians. And if we just take care of the music and take care of each other and not put so much um, credence into what what Downbeat Magazine says, or what Sony Records says, mm -hmm. or, or, or what whatever agency or festival says about, yeah, well, this is the hot young guy right now, yeah. and this is who we should be listening to, and who we should be booking. And no, the music always determines that. It's always about the music. It's not about. It's not about the industry. It's about the music. You know. If you can picture a bunch of uh, suits sitting around a table in those days, what kind of factors? did the musicians feel were being focused on to anoint somebody? I don't know if I asked that very well. You mean in the days prior to the 80s? Yeah, in the, in the, in, during this Young Lions oh. thing. Why would certain people get picked? Well, for usually for non-musical reasons. Mm -hmm. It was either the way they looked, if they had a certain look, uh, if they represented record sales, because, you know, record companies think in terms of demographics, who can we sell this product to, uh -huh. who can we sell this music to. Uh, and there was a time in the 80s where jazz became, um, there was renewed interest in the music, particularly in Japan, in Europe, uh, where there was a huge market for the music during the 1980s. Japan was experiencing an economic boom. I went there many times during that time. And the average... Uh, jazz fan in, in Japan would know every record you've ever done. You know, they know the catalog number, they know what date it was recorded on, they know who else was on the record, where you were born, you know, what you did. Like, wow, I did all of that? You know, or, you know, they know everything. Um, and the same thing in Europe, you know, you have this allegiance uh, to the music. Um, so certainly uh, in America, you know, there was a renewed interest amongst younger people and it became kind of hip with when yuppies were, mm. you know, were, were uh, having fun, you know, and making money, and it became a hip thing to be a part of. So um, the suits are certainly seeing all of this and going, hey, man, this is a potential audience we can sell to. Uh, but as it went along, it didn't become, it wasn't about the music. It really wasn't about, is this guy a great player necessarily, you know. Uh, you know, they're young, we can sell to young people, you know. Um, so in too many instances, it was done for non-musical reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's really the truth about it. Mm -hmm. Not always, but, but uh, yeah. quite often it was. Yeah. Was there a racial issue in any of this? Yeah, I don't know, uh, quite honestly. I, I suppose that there is or was. I mean, because, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about America. And right. race is always an issue one way or another. I have never felt it particularly in, in my own experience um, in dealing with record companies or industry people or even other musicians. I, I've never thought in terms of race, uh -huh. um, in terms of who do I want to play with or who, you know. The only black and white I care about is the music on the page, mm -hmm. you know, personally. Yeah. Um, 
but I have had discussions with, with people, a lot of different people, and I had heard that even, well, I'll give you an example. When I was playing with Lionel Hampton, uh, I didn't know this for a fact, but a couple of the guys in the band had told me that during the 70s or 80s when Lionel was putting a, a band together to tour Europe or Japan, that the promoters were concerned that there were too many white guys in the band because they want they felt that a black band was authentic mm -hmm. you know now it made no sense to me then and it made no it makes no sense to me now because when i was in the band uh in lionel's band it was a integrated group and it was a great he always had great musicians i mean there was always a, a great pool of musicians to draw from and i didn't understand it because i only thought that hey they just want a great band but it just goes to show that, you know, you can never take this stuff for granted and what some people are thinking about. Right. So, but other than that, I've never faced a, a racial issue um, like that. You know. Sometimes I think that people create one so they have something to write about. I think so. And, and honestly, uh, I think writers tend to write for each other. Mm. Um, and I have seen some articles. I, as a matter of fact, I have sort of taken a moratorium against some of the publications because I think even some of the more popular public music publications, because I have copies of articles from the 1960s and 70s where the journalism is really getting into what the, it's about the musician and what the musician is thinking about and what the musician is doing. Now, it's, in the last 10 years, it's become this hype machine um, that's really not about always, at least always, not about the musician. It's about some other factor in, in the industry. Um, and I've even read articles, I've even read reviews of my own records where, where writers are saying something, even when they're trying to say something positive, they're totally off base as to what I'm trying to do musically. And I mm -hmm. look at it and go, oh, is that what I was thinking about? Oh, I'm glad he knows, you know, because I wasn't thinking about anything when I wrote that. Or so, you know, I've, I, I, I really do think that there are writers out there who are responsible. Mm -hmm. I think there are responsible journalists, but we now have more than our share of those who don't know the music. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what it is to be an artist, so they can't speak from that perspective. So what right do they have to judge what artists are trying to do? Um, so, yeah, I've, I think there's a negative effect out yeah. there right now. I, I love this statement you just made in passing, and, and that was, I wasn't thinking of anything when I wrote that. Yeah. I mean, can you talk about that? Because uh, I think it's a very interesting thing, and like you said, I think sometimes we have to ha put a meeting on everything. Yeah, you know? yeah. I remember having a conversation uh, about three years ago with uh, Gary Peacock. Uh, we were both doing the, I think, the Montreal Festival, and I had never met him before, and I had a really fascinating conversation with him. I was very honored that he was talking to me, you mm -hmm. know. But he told me about an instance uh, when he was working with, um, I think, Albert Eiler or somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, at that time, you know, they were being pegged the angry black musicians yeah. because, you know, they're playing avant-garde, or so-called so called avant garde and Albert had read some review uh, and some, what, whoever the writer was, was talking about, oh, we can hear the anger and, uh, you know, about being, you know, oppressed and about Vietnam and about this and about that. And Albert said, man, it ain't about nothing. <laughs> it ain't about nothing, <laughs> you know. So that stuck with me because a lot of times these writers, when you read these reviews, they will write something and it's as if they're trying to tell the audience what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, at least give us the courtesy of coming to us to let us explain what agenda we have, if any, you know, rather than, you know, taking this upon themselves to interpret our music, mm -hmm. you know, for the benefit of the audience. No. And, and it's, there's another interesting um, book, uh, I think, called Composers on Music, which I had some years ago, lost it somewhere along the way. But it had... Um, Composers from, I think, like, uh, like Bach uh, on through to Aaron Copeland and where they read reviews of their works. And they were dealing with the same issues where the critics were 
talking about how invalid their particular work was or, mm -hmm. you know, um, finding anything wrong with it that they could just to, to advance their, their own agenda. I'm, I'm talking about the writer. Um, and it had the musicians writing to either, you know, like uh, relatives or to each other in some instances, uh -huh. you know, saying, you know, this, this critic is totally out of his mind. It had nothing to do with what I was working towards in this piece of music. So mm -hmm. it's an age old issue. It's nothing new. Yeah. You know. When you write, uh, you're getting to be, get more of your own tunes on your records and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, do you write at the piano? Yeah, I write primarily from the piano. Mm -hmm. Though I'm trying to change that now. I'm trying to to write more from melody first now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm using saxophone or flute to uh, okay. to try to think of melodies. Yeah. Does the creation of a new set of chords is that a challenge to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for instance, if I'm taking a standard tune and I want to do something a bit different with it, like we have this arrangement of uh, Swonderful that we do. And now, not that that tune needs anything reworked because it's a great, uh, immensely crafted tune. I mean, we're talking about Gershwin. Mm -hmm. So Gershwins don't need anybody rewriting anything. <laughs> um, but certainly, uh, to make the tune um, uh, to, to have it reflect the personality of uh, the quartet we work with and to not to bring it up to date but to add a little twist and I, as I'm r arranging the tune I'm thinking about well what was another way that Gershwin might have conceived the tune mm. so in other words I don't want to reharmonize this tune to where it has nothing to do with the song and I remember hearing Herbie Hancock some years ago. He had did an arrangement of, uh, I think, I Love You, with Cole Porter. And he basically modulated every four bar, every eight bars, I think it was. <laughs> but it wasn't so far away from the original concept of the tune. So you could still think of the lyric and the melody uh, staying intact, or at least the integrity of, of the lyric and the melody staying intact. So if I'm doing like a, a reharmonization, I'm not sitting there thinking like, oh man, how, how hip can I make this? Uh -huh. You know, how jazzed up can I make this? I'm thinking the opposite way. How true can I stay to the melody? How true can I stay to the integrity of the, of the composition? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, put some of my personality or our personality on it, you know, and just add a little twist, but not get away from, from what it's really about. And so when I'm writing my own music, I'm thinking that way now. I'm, I'm not trying to see how difficult or how intricate or how hip I can make anything. You know, I'm simply now trying to make a statement. And I'm finding that simplicity is the way to go. Mm -hmm. The simpler, the better. So even if I've written something that seems to take on uh, a little bit a few more curves not like I'm trying to edit it down to yeah. get to the bare bones you know it's much like a, a sculptor you know who's trying to get right to the core image you know? yeah yeah I always like it when I hear a new song and after it's done I can remember it mm -hmm. which means it's got to me anyway it's got a distinctive melody somehow. absolutely yeah. Or some hook. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's why now I'm trying to hear, I'm trying to deal with melody. Mm -hmm. For years, I wrote from chord changes, simply because I was so fascinated by chords and what they could do. Mm -hmm. But now, I, you know, I'm trying to hear, you know, voice leading in those chords, and I'm trying to hear melodies. Um, so I'm now trying to hear melodies first before I even go to chord changes. Because I found that, oh, you know, it's the melody that will dictate the chords, not oh. quite so much the other way around, mm -hmm. you know. And I find that there's a lot more freedom in that. Yeah. Yeah. I was pleased to see, um, I believe it's your last CD, that you have uh, all the members of your working band on it. Yeah. Is it hard to get to that place? It's very hard. It still is. Um, because all of these guys are, you know, first call musicians. So they end up doing a lot of different work. 
and which is what we all do now out of necessity. We have to be diversified in order mm -hmm. to make a living in this business. You've got to, you know, be ready to jump in a lot of different situations. Um, and it's hard to get consistent work with any one group now. I mean, which is, we were talking about the industry and the changes earlier. That, that's probably the major thing that has changed. It is almost impossible for most of us to get consistent work with the same group. Um, to put a tour together, you know, the expenses, it usually, you know, it usually doesn't pay for itself to put a tour mm. together. So you can't just, as much as we love to play, <laughs> you know, you we can't, eat. yeah, we have to eat, you know. Um, you know, I've got a kid to feed and uh -huh. the whole thing, you know. So, right. yeah, it's made it very difficult. But, yeah, we feel really lucky when we can to to play together. Uh, I mean, as we're talking, you know, Ed, our bassist, Ed Howard, just returned from Japan a week ago. Uh, Bruce Barth, our pianist, just returned from Japan a couple of weeks ago. And Adam Cruz is always on the road with different people, you know, Daniel Perez. Uh, it's always done different stuff, so, and I stay pretty busy doing other things, so mm -hmm. anytime we can put it together for more than a couple of days, we, we feel very happy. I can imagine just getting all four of you up here yeah. for three days, like yeah. schedules and all uh, yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, as soon as we get back, everybody's going, mm. you know. Now, fortunately, a week from today as we speak, we have a, a concert in Philadelphia where all four of us can actually make it, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that, but the very next morning, Ed is out to San Francisco with Shirley Horn, you know. So it, you know, that's that's the nature of the beast these right. days. Yeah. What other kinds of uh, gigs come your way? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, I I freelance with a lot of different people as a side man, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Mulgrew Miller, uh, James Williams, Buster Williams. Uh, various things in town, in, in New York, I mean, uh, uh, the subbing for someone on a big band or working with other people on recording dates, and I'm doing uh, some teaching, you know, these days. Yeah. So it's pretty diversified, uh, jumping all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. I was in Dayton, Ohio uh, a week ago doing a, a residency there um, as part of their arts program and actually doing a concert with the quartet in March. I'll be going out there two more times working with uh, high schools and colleges and uh, different workshops and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. We had mentioned the IAJE thing and uh, it seems like it's almost a necessity these days for jazz musicians to have, get involved in the education mm -hmm. scene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think fortunately, I, I, now I've seen a trend in the last 10 years where more of the street musicians have gotten involved, um, musicians that are in the scene, of the scene, uh, in addition to educators. And I think that's been a positive. Uh, I think uh, Bunky Green had a lot to do with that mm -hmm. when, when he was president, to get uh, a lot of the musicians involved. Of course, I, um, I know that even before that, there was, uh, you know, you had guys like Kenny Barron and Larry Ridley who were teaching at Rutgers, and then you had, uh, uh, Rufus Reed, who was head of the program at William Patterson for many years and recently retired. So there's always been that factor involved, but uh, in the more in, in more recent times, we've seen a big influx of that. And I hope that turns out to be a positive. Uh, because again, it's, it's, education is good, uh, but without the oral tradition to get the unteachable nuances, mm. so to speak, of the music, the spiritual um, elements of the music. There's nothing like the oral tradition. There's nothing like taking a younger musician aside and say, hey, you know what? Instead of doing it like that, think about it like this. You know, instead of counting in 4-4, four, four, count in 2-2, two, two. you know, which is another thing I learned from Lionel Hampton. Mm. Um, so all of those little things and, and talking about the experiences that we've all had with each other, you know, that's important in the development of, of young musicians. Yeah. And, and we can't, the music cannot go forward without that. There are different ways to disseminate the information. We can always learn about chord changes, about theory, which is great. And I think it's necessary to be a professional working musician these days. But those other 
things, those other intangibles, is always what made this music what mm -hmm. it is. It's, it, it is at its core and at its root, it's a folk music. Mm -hmm. This is really folk music, uh, first and foremost, and will always be. And that's, that's its greatness. That's part of its greatness. And I think any great music draws from that. Um, so, you know, you can't lose yeah. it, you know? I, I, I agree. Sometimes you, you see in uh, some of the magazines that you may have stopped reading uh -huh. where, they, you know, they analyze, they transcribe a solo and analyze it to death. Right. And every note has to have some function. Here's what the player was probably thinking, why right. they played this B flat. Right. Right. And I, I just like, well, maybe he didn't even mean to play that B flat. That's you know, right. It's like he needed to keep playing. That's, that's <laughs> right. And that's what happens so many times when you're right. I mean, sometimes the, uh, a certain note or group of notes has no agenda other than it, basically we forget that improvising, we, you know, two things are happening uh, of many things. But one, we're expressing ourselves. And the other thing is we're trying to get from A to B in some kind of fluid fashion. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means we're going to take detours, you know, and we may play a group of notes that may have no theoretical relevance, so to speak. But if you look at the whole statement, then you oh, hey, now I see. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can only analyze this music with so much. And it was never this music was did not evolve out of academe. You know, that came later. Yeah. You know, even classical music, that did not, I mean, that, all of the analyzation and stuff, that came later, you know, it was simply creating beautiful art, you know, right. so, and that's what it should be about. Yeah. I'm going to play a couple of uh, tunes, just little pieces for you. Mm -hmm. I guess we could call it a blindfold test. But okay. I, they're, okay. Uh, I, I'm sure that... Mm. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Cannonball. Uh, I don't know the particular recording from yeah. it. Um, obviously one of the live recordings. I'm, right. I'm, uh, I wanted to say, um, not Mercy Mercy, but uh, I, there's a live recording called uh, uh, I Know Why I Know Why I Feel So Bad, something like yeah, that. Yeah, Why Am I Treated So why Bad. Why Am I Treated So there Bad. There you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, man. Cannonball, to me, um, was the consummate altoist. Uh, his tone, his sound, his approach, and you look at um, his career, you could apply that tone to, you know, jazz, R&B, classical. You know, listen to some of those records he did uh, in the 50s with strings, uh, the things that, uh, what was it? Um, Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah, uh, and there was another one, like in the, er, in the mid 50s. Um, I can't remember the title of it. Uh, I think he's doing some Ellington pieces on there. And he's playing <clears throat> in a very classical like mm. tone, but very expressive and very beautiful. You know, almost sounds like a cello sometimes. But he had, to me, just the consummate concept of, of alto. Mm saxophone, which for a lot of people who don't know, is it's like I always tell people, it's the easiest one to start on and the hardest one to master. Mm. The alto, man, it constantly has me in a headlock. It's, it's, a, it's a really difficult instrument to master. And I've had this conversation with just every other altoist. You know, John Gordon, who's a wonderful uh, altoist, we talk about this a lot. I've had this conversation with Kenny Garrett, and we always talk about, yeah, man, that alto, whoo, you know, <laughs> you know, but we keep at it, you know. Yeah, but yeah. the Cannonball, um, yeah, one of my favorites. Yeah. He had such a electricity about him and his personality, too, you know. One of the yeah. few people who seemed uh, comfortable talking with his audience and mm -hmm. getting the music across from yeah. From that standpoint. Yeah, and that's very important. He was a great communicator, mm. with, with and without the instrument. 
um, and you listen to him talk, you know, and he's very eloquent, uh, but very funny at times and, and right to the point. Yeah. Uh, and you just, I got the chance to see him live when I was, I think, maybe 12 years old. And he just brings you right into the music, brings you mm -hmm. right in, you know, and you listen to those records, the like country preacher, you know. I used to listen to that record for him talking as much as him yeah. playing, you know. His inflections and what right. he was saying, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, you know that spot in the record where they're doing country preacher and the first time it hits that break? Right. And there's that silence. And when they come back in and the people oh, yeah. go crazy. Right, right. <laughs> it's like, man. Yeah, it's like church. Powerful. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, that hit me directly, you know, because it was like going to church, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, Cannonball, um, to me, um, represented, you know, the past, present, and future. Mm. And he even mentions that on that record, you know, he talks about the that's past, right. present, and future of our music, you know, yeah. and that's really what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me see if I can um, negotiate this. Oh, boy. Now this tune is all one change. Mm -hmm. Is that the idea? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could talk about this one all day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Eddie Harris. That's Eddie Harris. Yeah, yeah. the original Freedom Jazz Dance. Mm -hmm. um, boy, there's so many things we could talk about. Um, what I usually point out to people, and particularly my students, when I usually bring a recording of this in, mm -hmm. because most young students, when they learn Freedom Jazz Dance, they learn Miles' version of it. And they've never heard this version, the original, and what it's really about. The real, the real catalyst on this recording is Billy Higgins. Uh, because you hear the whole tradition of black music in, in his playing on this, from New Orleans forward. You hear that second line, you hear, you hear Congo Square, you hear uh, swing, you hear funk. It's dancing. It's all about dance, you know. And he's really, the, just his, I remember listening to this record once uh, about 15 years ago. And I listened, used to listen to it over and over and over and over. And just to listen to Billy Higgins' snare drum on this record, just his snare, it's like a symphony because it keeps developing, it keeps going, it keeps opening up. And it's what is propelling Eddie and everybody else to play what they play. You know, and, and most play, bass players don't know the original bass line that Ron is playing, just that one simple figure. But it's what makes it, mm. you know. Uh, and Eddie, to me, who was the unsung genius of, of saxophone and one of the unsung geniuses of, of this music, and he's, he's probably been one of the biggest influences on me. Um, one of the first people, well, probably the first guy that I idolized, so to speak, even before I could even pick up a saxophone. Mm. Uh, I used to love his records, man. I love, love them still, but um, he covered the whole history of music. You know, when you listen to all those different records he did in the 60s, where he's doing Breakfast at Tiffany's, yeah. You know, or Exodus. And, you know, then, you know, Freedom Jazz Dance, you know, and then, and then with his work with the electronics, which, you know, we talk about electronics and, man, this guy was ahead of everybody right. when it came to electronics. You know, all the things he did, reed trumpet, you know, uh, saxophone mouthpiece on the trumpet. And, and there's that recording of Olio where he's playing, you know, the tenor saxophone with a trombone mouthpiece. You know that one I'm not aware of. Yeah, they, they, they just re-released this record. There's one of the, the first records I was into after Swiss Movement was a record called Excursions, and it was a two-record set, and uh, which came out like I think 1973 or 74, and it was a compilation of different sessions, some of the things that hadn't been released, and one on one of those uh, tunes he's playing Olio, 
uh, I don't remember who the band is right now, but um, uh, in the middle of the solo, he's, he plays a cappella and with the trombone mouthpiece and on his tenor. You know, I mean, amazing. And not just as a gimmick, but he really developed all of mm -hmm. this stuff. You know, he was an amazing musician. And the language that he, he had his own language, the language he developed. Also in this record, you know, I played for my, one of my students recently, um, Love for Sale, which is on this record. Mm -hmm. And to do what he does on that tune, you know, with these force and things, playing the tune, nobody was thinking about that, when, you know, when he did that. So, to me, Eddie is one of the great innovators, one of the great unsung geniuses, man. Um, we were listening to, on the way up here, in the car, um, I have a tape of uh, this, uh, uh, um, a Eddie Harris record of him just talking oh. live in the performances. And I don't, I don't know if I can say the title here. I don't know if. Uh, oh, it's know. all right. Okay, Eddie Harris talking shit is what oh, it's called. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he's just going on and on talking about different things, you know, to the audience, yeah. you know. But he was a true original, true yeah. original man. Yeah. I, yeah, he didn't seem to care. Was it? Didn't he have an album called? Um, I need the money. Yeah, I need some money. I need some money. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's like yeah. you just put it out there. It, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I never got to meet him uh, personally, unfortunately, uh, because uh, you know there's a small group of us uh, who are big Eddie Harris fans. So David mm -hmm. Hazeltine is a great pianist. He played with Eddie for uh, a, a bit. Uh, Johnny King is another great pianist. You know, we, he's another Eddie Harris fan and. Um, young tenor player by the name of uh, Mark Turner. Um, there's a this little Eddie Harris fan club we uh -huh. all get together and talk about, you know. Uh, yeah, I just can't say enough about it, man. Just a true genius, you know. Yeah. Could play anything, could play anything. And master of altissimo long before, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some of the guys we think about now, but just a true master of it, yeah. Well, I have one more thing here, which I'm, I'm sure you'll recognize. Do you uh, listen to your own records very often? <laughs> Not very often, only no. because I'm too self-critical of my yeah. own. You know, thinking, oh, if, you no. know, if only I could have done this. Or, uh -huh. What was I thinking about? Why did I play that? Oh, you know, why did I sound that way? You know, I'm, I mean, this you were after that, right? Yeah. That kind of that little dissonant thing. There. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, I was very happy with the way this, this particular cut came out, though. Nice lines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, there's a little story in the title of that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, of course, it's called uh, QB Rap, uh -huh. which is barbecue spelled backwards. Oh. And, I was uh, wondering. Yeah, 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 and of course, there's a couple of different connections to that. Of course, the, it's a second line beat, mm -hmm. you know, which of course is from New Orleans. So you can think about, you know, strutting with some barbecue. Of course, mm -hmm. it's a little homage to Louis Armstrong. Yeah. But the actual title came from I got it from a, a book from Bobby Seal, of course, who was a former Black Panther and later on became a professor at Temple University. Mm -hmm. And he, for a while, he became famous for his barbecue recipes. And he had a book called QB Rap with Bob, Bobby Seale. I'll be darned. So, so here's, we have a second line rhythm in an odd meter, you know. Uh, so you can think about the barbecue part, but with a little twist on it, you know, mm -hmm. QB Rap, you know. So that's kind of a connection with the, with the title. Uh, of course, new, uh, Nicholas Payton, being from New Orleans, you know, um, yeah. I had him in mind when I wrote this piece. Uh, if, if a student was watching this interview and he said a number of times you've mentioned the second line, 
Mm -hmm. They might not know what you're talking about. Yeah. A uh, second line rhythm is uh, like uh, uh, a rhythm from New Orleans. Uh, now, I don't know the exact origin of it, uh, but I think it came out of what they used to call the cakewalk um, from the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And it was like a dance. And so you hear second line rhythm a lot. Like uh, if you listen to like recordings of when the saints go marching in. So it's sort of like a combination of a march and dance rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, and you hear that rhythm in uh, groups like the Meters, wh who you know, uh, have an association with the Neville brothers, mm -hmm. uh, Aaron Neville and the rest of the brothers from down there. Um, so, yeah, you, it, and, and actually that, uh, that rhythm uh, became popular again because of people like Wynton Marcellus and, and Jeff Watts, who when they came on the scene, they, they brought, and Donald Harrison and Terrence Blanchard, they used that rhythm a lot in their compositions, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's become now a part of, you know, a very common part of our language. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, when I was kind of choosing a couple things to put it here, I went from the Eddie Harris thing, mm -hmm. and then I put your CD on, and I found some similarity there oh, yeah. between those two songs. Yeah, that was yeah. Interesting. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because the, the foundation of what Billy Higgins is playing on Freedom Jazz Dance mm -hmm. is, is right from second line. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can hear it, it's right in there. Ed Blackwell's another one, you know, his uh, the rhythms that he played came right out of second line, yeah. you know. Uh, it was one of the, the rhythms that fed uh, one, of the, one of the seeds for swing to develop um, because there's a triplet involved, uh -huh. you know. Uh, and it has a way of sort of making the beat and the feel elastic, you know, which gives it, gives it that mm -hmm. bounce, you know. Uh, so certainly, yeah, that's a part of it. And particularly in QB rap, there's a lot of elements that I was addressing. Um, and even the record, the whole recording, uh, passages, pardon me, which is the title of that. The purpose, I guess, that I had in mind was to to bring together all of the influences that I've had uh, as a musician and, and growing up and hearing all of these different kinds of music and uh, jazz and R&B and funk, um, avant-garde, you know, I mean, within that, within the thread of that tune, you know, you can find, you know, Eddie Harris, Ornette Coleman, you know, second line, um, cool in the gang. I even there's cool a the there's gang. a figure in there right Neat. out of cool in the gang. You know, Hollywood swinging. Uh -huh. You know, de -da -da -de -da, ba -da -da. there you go. And that's, yeah. that's what it is. You know, so and and by the way, in their pre cool in the gang life, they they were a jazz group. Yeah. You know, and uh, so I was very influenced by them. You know, particularly Ronald Bell, who was heavily influenced by John Coltrane. Mm. Um, so, so the music to me is all this uh, incredible tapestry, you know, with these different threads. Or we could think about it with a, an amazing tree with all of these branches, you know. Um, and it's all music, you know, it's all a continuum. And I try not to so much in my own music, try not to say, uh, well, we can't allow ourselves to think this way because we're thinking that way. You know, um, we all are who we are because of what we grew up with. You know, we were all fed on different things, mm -hmm. you know, artistically and, and just as human beings. So I think the artist being true to oneself brings all of that in. You know, you can't deny who you are. You are who you are, you know. Uh, so bring it all in there. That's, that's what it's all about. That's what art is all about, honesty, you know. So bring it all in. Yeah. And that's what I feel like we were able to accomplish with this record. Yeah, yeah I believe so. And it, it seems like it's an innovation in a sense when you're, when you're bringing all those elements together. Because I've often wondered if it's constantly getting harder for people to become innovators. It's a good question. Well, it gets back again to industry stuff because, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you had this term 
neoclassism thrown around a lot when it came to jazz. Mm. And they would often associate Wynton Marcellus with, well, he's a neoclassicist because he's playing in the style of Miles or the style of Lewis or whatever. Uh, you know, I mean, now, the musicians never thought, we never sat around talking, yeah, you know what, I want to play something in a neoclassicist vibe. You know, <laughs> you know yeah. um, we never think that way. Um, we're simply trying to, you know, create music from what we've grown up with and mm -hmm. to evolve as artists. And only time can take care of what is innovation and what is not. Uh, Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker, Duke Ellington, none of them ever sat down and said, you know what, I'm going to be an innovator. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll write something that will change the way people think about everything. I will play something that, that will change the way people play. None of them ever said that. They simply were pursuing their vision of, of music and art. And um, I remember, there's a great quote from Duke Ellington when he did not receive, uh, I think it was a Nobel Peace Prize in 1969 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And when he was rejected for it and someone told him about it and Duke said, well, I guess I wasn't supposed to be too famous too soon. And here he had, here's a guy who had been around for 50 years at that point yeah. and had already left an amazing legacy. And that just gives you a sense of where he was. He wasn't yeah. thinking about accolades or accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And of course now we know him to be probably one of the greatest innovators, if not the greatest, of 20th century music, mm -hmm. period, uh, of any category. And his music was beyond category. So, so yeah, I think um, if we stay true to ourselves as artists, as musicians, and, and as, as human beings, the innovation will come. Mm -hmm. Time will take care of what, you know, of that legacy. You know, we, we have to just do what we do and let everything else take care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we need to wrap up and get on to our next thing. Okay. Any, anything that uh, you'd like to add here that I haven't well, hit on? I just want to say that I'm very privileged to be a part of this wonderful legacy that you all have here. I mean, just the list of people that you've interviewed and the list of people you've had here at the college. Um, it's very important what you're doing and I hope you continue it. And it's, I'm just very privileged and honored to be in this line of all great musicians that have been here. So thanks very much well, for thank having you. me. thank you. We've had a, a ball. a great here. pleasure for me. Thanks. <laughs> right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah.